Good evening and welcome to the Word and Sword TV broadcast brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. We're glad that you've tuned in to be with us tonight and we thank you for that honor. We know that you could be tuned to other places, but thank you so much for tuning in tonight as we study the Bible together on the subject of conversion, particularly in the book of Acts related to the church at Ephesus. So that's what we'll be talking about tonight. So if you have your Bibles, please get them and make sure that we're teaching you things from God's Word and that we're not just uh, teaching you whatever we please. That uh, Again, we are all about what the Word of God says because it really doesn't matter what you think or what I think or what any church thinks. It matters what the Bible says. And that's the, the book on which we'll be judged one day and that's what we need to do. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to take from it. It is sufficient in and of itself to guide us into all things we need. And that's all we need is the Word of God today to guide us and see God's directions for us on how to go to heaven. So if you have your Bibles, make sure that you check out what I'm saying tonight and that you, if you find me to be in error in any way, you'd be my friend if you'd call in and tell us about that. But if you find us to be teaching the truth, or maybe that we'll t be teaching some things that you haven't really considered or heard before tonight. So if that's the case, and maybe you'd like to study the Bible with us further, we would be glad to do that because none of us want to be wrong about what God wants us to do. We all want to be pleasing to God and serve the Lord like we should. And I assume that if you're tuned into this program, you care about Bible things and you care about uh, eternal things. And if that's the case with you tonight, then we appreciate it. But for whatever reason you have turned, tuned in, we thank you for that. We have some things that we would like to make you aware of. This is a live program, by the way, and you're invited to call in while the program is in progress. We have operators that are standing by now. The number is 828-485-5555, and that will be scrolling on the bottom right-hand corner of your uh, screen all night. And uh, the operators are ready right now to receive your calls if you'd like to call in. You can call and have a Bible question if you would like, and uh, you can ask for a copy of this lesson tonight in hard copy, or you can uh, get the location of where to go, go get it on your computer if you would like. You can ask for a copy of this presentation or previous presentations we've had. This uh, program has been on the, the, the air for in excess of 35 years. And uh, fastly approaching 40 years, it's been on the air here in Hickory. And uh, we are uh, glad to come into your home and we want you to know right up front that anything we offer on this program, our correspondence courses or any tracks that we would send you, anything like that is free of charge. There is no charge even for postage. We are glad to provide that for you if you want it mailed to you or if you'd like references on where to find things, we can certainly do that. But uh, nothing, do, please, please do not send us any money. Uh, the Newton Church of Christ funds this program and does it fully from their funds that they have set aside for evangelism, which is a work of the local church. And uh, they have been doing this for many, many years and uh, they are just glad to do this for, for all of us uh, to provide this means by which we can study the Bible honestly together. And uh, thank you again for tuning in. Well, the, if you look at the, at the charts here, um, you can call tonight and ask for a copy of this presentation. Of course, we have two of those. One of them you can take online. You can ask for a free tract. And a tract is nothing in the world but a, a sermon uh, that is written down. You can ask for a map to our building in uh, 656 St. James Church Road, or you can just Google it in your phone. And ask to be added to the quarterly mailing list of the bu bulletin for the church at Newton. And that is mailed out quarterly, but it is a weekly uh, publication. You can get free biblical study aids by going to www.wordandsword.com. A number of links are there. Uh, if you're a Bible student and like to study the Bible and like to compare possible translations, things along those lines, and, uh, concordances, Bible dictionaries, things like that, or just sermons, there are several sites that are there where you can pretty well, well get the answers to just about any question you might have biblically. But also we would urge you if, uh, if you are local to, to give us a call. 
because we will be glad to provide any Bible answer we can to your question. You can call in tonight with a biblical question or comment. You can receive a Bible verse, a book, chapter, and verse answer to your question. And if we can't provide that adequately tonight, then we will take your name and we will make sure we cover your question in detail. And even if you'd like it dealt with on the air, we can do that. And we've had several people that have asked uh, a few weeks ago what we dealt with was speaking in tongues, for instance. Uh, what does the Bible say about that? And we had very good response to those programs. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking in detail a little bit about baptism and about what baptism really is. Why is it such a controversial subject among religious people? And why is it that there are so many people that don't think it matters when the Bible is very clear that it does matter? So um, get your Bibles, get ready to study as we go through God's Word tonight and uh, study our Bibles together. And I think we're already locked up. So You can also, if you're advanced far beyond what I am, uh, you can go to facebook.com slash word and sword and like us there or go to facebook.com slash Newton North Carolina Church of Christ and like us there or, and post a question if you have one there. Uh, and also you can go to Twitter and post a question at word and sword and like us or unlike us or whatever you would like. Uh, you can also post a biblical question or comment at any of these means and we try to cover all the means that somebody might have. Now we can't cover every app that is on your phone or every different uh, app that's popping up every day but these are the main ones and so you can contact us there and we would appreciate it. Also please call tonight if you have a question. We want you to know that the, uh, and invite you to attend the assemblies at the uh, 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Uh, the regular assembly times are each Sunday, Bible study at 9.30, worship at 11, and Wednesday nights they have Bible study at 7 p.m. There's a gospel meeting actually taking place uh, beginning November the 4th through the 10th. That would be the uh, Monday before our next program. And November the 4th through the 10th, Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock. Mark that on your calendar, if you will, and come out and let us meet you as you attend these services. We'd love to just meet you and uh, come and be a part of the, uh, of the services there. Uh, Monday through Friday, it will be at 7 p.m. Sunday, it'll be at its regular service times. And then also these sermons will be presented by Brother Ron Halbrook. He, he is the evangelist at Hebron Lane Church of Christ in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. I've known him a number of years and he's been to several meetings there at Newton uh, in the last 10 years and uh, always does a fine job of presenting God's Word in a very thorough manner, very kind manner. And uh, you will find yourself benefited by sitting at his feet and hearing him preach God's Word. But he will tell you that you need to get your Bible out and you need to check to make sure that what he's saying is true. Any preacher that uh, does not want to be checked out on what he's saying to make sure it's from the Bible is a preacher you don't need to be listening to. Well, the lessons are going to be on Monday night, evidences that God exists. A lot of people uh, wonder how in the world we know that God exists. Some people just don't know and they wonder about that. Also, he'll be talking on Tuesday night about the moral glory of Christ. Wednesday night, when Peter confessed Jesus. Thursday night, back to the Bible. What a great subject that would be. All of these subjects sound very rich. And then on Friday night, the prison of sin. And you may be in that prison, even tonight. And there's a way out of that prison. It's legal, and it's the best thing for you. And you'll never make a better decision than to leave the prison of sin. Saturday night, he'll be speaking on helping each other. That's a very appropriate lesson, particularly in this day and time, uh, where we reach out beyond ourselves. And that'll be a very good lesson for all of us to see. Uh, many people sit back and they're all concerned about themselves. When the Bible really teaches that our concern should be more toward others than for ourselves. Uh, we get so wrapped up in ourselves. What about me? What about me? What about me? And selfishness. So that, that, he'll be dealing with that on Saturday night. And then Sunday, Lord, to whom shall we go? From John chapter 6, in verse 68, where Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? When uh, they ask him, uh, he asked him, his own apostles, he said, are you going to leave me too? 
people were leaving him because he was preaching the truth and they didn't like it. And so they began to leave him. Notice that Jesus didn't say, well, tell them I'm awful sorry that I've hurt their feelings and go get them and we'll just, we'll just coddle them back in. No, he didn't say that. He just asked, will you leave me too? And Peter replied, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And then Saturday or Sunday night, he'll, or Sunday morning, in the regular service time, he'll be preaching on preserving unity in Christ Jesus. In John 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, all speak of the unity that Christians should have in Christ Jesus, and that will be the center of what he'll be talking about. Uh, one of the reasons that Jesus uh, prayed for unity in John uh, chapter 17 was so the world might believe that God had sent him. And certainly when there is disunity among brethren and among people in the religious world, that is a true sign that the world that needs to come to Christ can't find the way because the Christians are acting like the world. And so it's a very important lesson. And so we urge you to come for this wonderful rich week of gospel preaching. And notice that's what it's for. You know, if you'll notice on this announcement, we don't have anything on here that says we're going to feed you. We don't have anything in here that says that we're going to entertain you at all. We're just going to have you come, bring your Bibles, open the Bible, and study the Word of God together as, we, as Brother Halbrook speaks to us. And so come and be a part of this effort this next week. And if you are a Christian and you haven't been inviting your friends to come to this, you need to get started. Let people know. Offer them a ride to, to, the, to the services. And do all you can to bring all the people you can to hear the precious message of Jesus Christ presented each night. And this is a wonderful effort and appreciate the church there uh, providing this time for us. And uh, we are going to do everything we can to, to bring people to Christ and provide opportunities for people to hear the Word. And that's all we, all we offer is the Word of God presented in its truth and in its simplicity. Well, the Word and the Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. And you can contact us another way, and this is probably a unique way, but it's how everybody used to, used to contact everybody. You can just write us a letter, folks. You can go to email if you'd like at contact at wordandsword.com and write a letter that way if you'd like. Or you just handwrite a letter. And maybe you, have a, uh, maybe you don't have a typewriter or a computer, but you do have a pen and pencil. So write us and uh, send it to us by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And that's the Newton Church of Christ, P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. You can also call the building at 828-465-3009. Leave a message there and someone will get right back in contact with you for anything, any concern you may have www.wordandsword.com is the website. We bring that to your attention again so that you can go and provide, avail yourself of all the study helps that are there on that, on that site. Well, most important question in the world, folks. What must I do to be saved? Again, we're not going to talk about what you think and what I think or what your church teaches and what I think uh, this person believes or that person believes. Just recently, I want to bring this up, uh, Mr. Graham came to Franz Stadium and there were over 7,200 to 8,000 people, maybe some have estimated as high as 9,000 that were at that uh, venue here in Hickory, North Carolina. And certainly it is so good to see so many people that are interested in hearing anything to do with the Word of God and righteousness and living a moral life. That is a wonderful thing. But it is a shame that that many people are together to hear what God's Word says and, all, and what they hear when it comes to salvation is they just need to accept Jesus. And if they'll just accept Jesus, they'll be saved. Stand up, hold your hands up, and then they bring them down and they say a sinner's prayer and they're saved. Friends, if that's what the Bible taught, I would be teaching it. But my Bible, as far as I know, and my Lord does not, did not teach that. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, we are to hear Jesus. 
hear Him. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. And what do we hear? The Word of God. So I can't be saved without faith, and I get faith by hearing what God's Word says to me. It's the way God talks to us today, folks. He doesn't talk to us and whisper to us in some small voice individually. For then He would be a respecter of persons. And so what He's done is He's written it all down for us. He's written it down right here. You can read it. I can read it. We can understand it. And it's the same for everybody. Doesn't matter what color you are, how old you are, how young you are. You can read this. And you can know, if you can read, you can know what God's plan for you is. You can read these passages. In John 8, 24, if you don't believe that, he's, that He is the Lord, you'll die in your sins, Jesus said. And in Romans 10, verse 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Galatians 3, 26, we're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So, you know, you see there that that belief is tied with those who are seeking. And so you have to be seeking the ways of God in order to find those ways. And the ways are revealed in His Word. And you may need to be like the eunuch. You need to some, have somebody sit down and explain it to you uh, more perfectly. And that certainly is something we can do. We're very ready to do that. So we all would agree that belief or faith is absolutely essential for salvation. And in order to have faith, we have to hear what God's Word says, don't we? Well, I think everyone also would agree with what Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, that we must repent of our sins. Except we repent, we'll all perish. Acts 2 and verse 38, we see there, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 17 and verse 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He commands all men everywhere to come to repentance. And so we would, so we would all recognize that you can't live your old life of sin anymore when you come to Christ. You've got to put those things away. But you know the interesting thing was that what was said in that stadium the other night was that all you have to do is just accept Jesus. Didn't say a word about changing the way you live. Didn't change, say a word about uh, anything but believing what you have heard about Jesus. What are we supposed to believe about Jesus? Is it just faith only? If so, James tells us in James chapter 2 that the demons believe, but I don't think there's anyone in this world that's a religious person that would say a demon can be saved. So, it's not just faith, friends. There's more involved than that. Changing the way that you live. And then also confessing with your mouth. Matthew chapter 10, 32, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. Acts 8, 27 through 39, we find the eunuch when he was, Jesus was preached to him, said, here's some water, what keeps me from being baptized? And he said, well, if you believe, you can. He said, well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So confession with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is absolutely essential in order to be saved. That was mentioned, faith and confession. But now look at Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 4 through 6, Galatians 3, 27, and 1 Peter 3, 21. We'll put these up here for you. Just look at these passages, if you will. The Bible is very clear, and Jesus Himself stressed baptism in Mark 16, 16. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that was after they had had the Word of God preached to them. And then in Acts 2 and verse 38, we find when the people heard what, that they had crucified their own Messiah, they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. In Romans 6, 4 through 6, baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
And in Galatians 3 and verse 27, we find we put Christ on in baptism. In 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the interrogation or answer of a good conscience toward God. So what do we have here? All these passages, friends, teach that we must be baptized. We must confess Christ as our Savior. We must repent of our sins. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we must do all this from hearing what God has for us to do. Reading and understanding, fathoming what God wants us to do. And after that, after we've been baptized into Christ, He adds us to His church, Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who was being saved? Those who were repenting and being baptized, based upon their faith in the Lord and confession that He is the Son of God. Well, you have to live faithful. If you fulfill all these commandments, you'll be saved and the Lord will add you to His church. And you'll be a Christian and a Christian only. And you would be, you are expected by God to serve Him faithfully unto death. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. We have to continue, Matthew 24 and verse 13. We have to be faithful even in the face of dire circumstances. We have an obligation to be faithful to the Lord. And faithful means full of faith. How do we get faith? Remember, we get faith by hearing the Word of God. So we have to continue to study it just as we're doing tonight. Continue to study God's Word so that we could be the people that we need to be and so that we can keep our lives tuned to what God wants us to do. Well, if you want to come back to me and uh, let's go ahead and start our lesson this evening. Well, we've been studying for several weeks now about conversions. And remember what we've said about conversions. To be converted means to bring over from one belief or view or party in religious matters to another. So it's a changeover. We know that when you convert fractions, you come from one situation to something else. Uh, and we know the word conversion in electricity, from AC to DC or DC to AC that that involves a changing or a coming over from one thing to another. And in the biblical things and in spiritual things, it means coming over from one belief or party to another. Did you know that everyone that was converted in the New Testament left what they believed, turned their back on what they had believed, and turned toward what God was teaching and toward those that were speaking from God's Word? They turned away from things that they had lived all their lives. How hard must it have been for a Jew to have turned aside from the old law and realized that it had been nailed to the cross and his whole lifestyle changed. He had been used to providing a sacrifice for many things on a daily basis and also yearly basis for sin. And now things were different. That would be a tremendous change in his lifestyle, wouldn't it? Do you suppose that there were people who were too stubborn to change? I think so. They chased Paul all over the country, trying to get him to stop preaching what they were preaching. They didn't like it, but it didn't stop him from preaching the truth. Paul basically says later on in the book of Acts, toward the end, when he gets to address the people that have been uh, persecuting him, he says, I know exactly how you are. I used to be one of you. But he says, I, I changed. And he tells them why he changed. Now, friends, you can't get mad at the message if it's from God's Word. You have, your argument is with God. And that's why we are always safe when we give our arguments for why we do what we do and we prove things by the Bible. Because the Bible is God's Word. It's His inspired Word for us today. And it will be that way. No matter what government does or no matter what man may say, the Word of God will always be there. And it will be our guide. Man has tried to destroy it for many, over many times, over many years, but we still have it with us today, don't we? So let's see what the Bible says tonight about conversions. Changing from one form or function to another. 
What does the Bible say? Well, in Acts chapter 19, and if you want to look at this map, we'll just go through the third missionary journey of Paul and go through some of the places that he's been. Now, by missionary journeys, we're talking about how Paul was traveling and what he was doing. Well, he, at Philippi, he converts a, a lady named Lydia, and you can go to the chart, please, if you will. Please go to the chart. He converts a lady named Lydia and a, and a jailer that live in the town of Philippi. And they hear the gospel, they believe, and they're baptized. Acts 16, verse 11 through 34. And he go, travels up that way, and then he goes from there to a place called Thessalonica. And the people were there that were there were persuaded of the things that he was preaching and teaching, and they received the Word of God. But certain Jews rejected it, and so Paul had to travel again to a different place. And he went to a town called Berea, and that is over in Macedonia, just as Thessalonica is. And many in Berea heard with readiness. They searched it out to see if it, was be, if it was true, which all of us should do. And they received the gospel, according to Acts 17, verses 10 through 14, as it was the Word of God. And they obeyed that Word. They did what it said. They listened, they checked it out, and they obeyed. Well. After that, Paul goes to a place called Athens, Athens, Greece, very famous city. All these places were places where people uh, from other areas would gather. Look at the coastal areas where all of these places are located. And the soil was more difficult in Athens in Acts 17 when he went there. But when he went there, he was waiting for his companions to come and be with him. And while he was there, he began to observe the city and the way that people were worshiping other gods. And it pricked his heart. It touched him that they were putting forth the effort to worship, but in the wrong way. And so he addressed some of them on Mars Hill. Some were willing to receive what he had said from God's Word as God directed him in his speaking, and they were uh, willing to repent and to be numbered with the disciples. They obeyed what God's Word taught, and they changed their lives. Well, in Acts 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to a very wicked town called Corinth. And the Lord said, I want you to stay here because I've got many people in this city. Well, he's been to some pretty wicked cities already, hasn't he? Thessalonica was no, no, no uh, innocent place. Philippi wasn't an innocent place. Port cities, all of them. And then you had Berea, and then you have uh, Corinth now. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went on to Corinth, and he stayed there for some time, about a year and a half. Paul remained for about a year and a half, and he took leave of the brethren, and then went to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila went with him, and they were companions of his. They all made tents, and they evidently had a little business. And in uh, Syria, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea because he had taken a vow of some kind, and it was a vow that he took voluntarily, not religiously, and he had his hair cut at that, that point. Well, from there, he goes to a place, Acts 18, verses 18 and 19. He came to a town called Ephesus. Ephesus, again, very large city, had a renowned library there, and he left them there, left his companions. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews several, days, several weeks. In Acts 18, in verse 21 and 22, it says there, But he took leave of them and said, I must by all means keep this coming, the coming feast in Jerusalem. But I'll return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea and had gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. So, notice how far he went. This is about the years 54 through 58. He traveled about 2,800 to 3,000 miles, and that was not by airplane or anything like that. It was tough travel. Notice the mountains that he passed over. These are the Taurus Mountains uh, in these areas of Asia particularly. 
And he traveled over these mountains, and then he also had desert areas, plains areas, all types of terrain that he's traveling over. What's he doing? He's preaching the gospel, friends. Why is he preaching the gospel? He's preaching the gospel because people's souls are lost, and they need to hear the gospel. And that's what he's all about, is taking the message to a lost world. It's what the Lord wanted him to do, all the apostles. And all Christians, even today, we have a precious message. It will heal the world, but we need to get out in the world and teach it. And if there is any area of our lives as Christians that is weaker than any other, it is truly, I believe, our lack of fervent evangelism and wanting to go out and reach our neighbors that are lost. We live next door to them. We live on the same street with them for years and never know their names. Never ask them if they've ever thought about being a servant of the Lord or if they are. Never ask them how they came to the conclusion that they were a servant of the Lord. How were you saved? Never have asked that. These are questions we need to ask and we're going to ask some of them tonight. In Acts 18 and verse 23, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the regions of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And so now he is at Ephesus. And again in Acts 21 verse 17 is where this story of the church at Ephesus ends. It begins in Acts 18 and verse 23. The third missionary journey would prove to be the longest of Paul's trips, lasting about four years, and ended in Jerusalem with his arrest and the beginning of the end for him. He began his third missionary tour like he did the second one, by revisiting some previously established churches and strengthening the believers that were there. You know, all of us as Christians need to listen and be, be sure that our faith is secure too. Because the church is absolutely essential for our functioning as Christians. And it is essential that we as brethren strengthen ourselves. And that's why, for instance, the church at Newton is having this gospel meeting this next on November the 4th through the 10th. And that is to encourage the outside people, certainly, but also to build up the church that is there. And we all need that. Every church needs building up, and the building up is from the Word of God. But you know, it's very important that Christians be there. You know, have you ever, how would you feel if somebody invited you to their house and then they weren't there? Come over, we're going to have dinner. Really? Well, yeah. And they, then you come in, come to their house, knock on the door, and the dinner's on the table, but there's no people. How would you feel? Well, you'd be kind of insulted, and rightly so. When we invite people to come to our house, then we show, we show up ourselves, don't we? And so it's important that all of us as Christians make sure that we are on fire to hear God's Word. We are like those at Cornelius' house. We have come to hear. We are here to hear God's Word. We're ready. We're enthusiastic about it. We're zealous about it. And we can't wait to be with God's people. That's how Christians should be, friends. We don't want to be like the child that's selling the Girl Scout cookies or the Boy Scout popcorn that comes to your house and say, you don't want none of this, do you? Well, that's a poor way to get somebody to do something. And if you don't want it, then why would anybody else want it? And that, we, we send those signals sometimes as, as Christians. And we, we want everybody else to be saved, but we're not particularly interested in it. Well, how in the world do we expect anybody to be on fire to serve God if the people that have been serving Him for so many years, that they know they're not doing it. You see, we don't get to stop after we come out of the baptistry. That's when the work begins, one brother said. And that's exactly true. Paul started his third missionary journey, remember, after a stay in Antioch of Syria, which is where all the fighting is going on right now. A lot of the fighting on the border between Turkey and Syria is going on right now in this very region we're talking about tonight. About a year or two uh, took place after he was in Antioch, and this new trip begins with him going through Galatia and Phrygia, and there's a lot of Christians there, and he wants to encourage them and strengthen them. And boy, how we all need that. It's always good to take note of the example that Paul and others set for us 
and when they made efforts to try to strengthen the saved. Peter, in his writing in 1 Peter, says, I'm telling you things that you already know. I'm not telling you anything new. You already know it. But you need to study it more. And certainly that's the way it is with all of us. We forget. We're humans. We get lazy. We do what we want to do sometimes. And Satan is certainly busy in churches. But we need to put ourselves to the task of learning what God wants us to do and strengthening ourselves and letting the Word of God touch all of us. Every time we come to worship God, we should let the Word of God be something that we are ready to change us. We're ready to have the Word of God change us. And we are ready to give, not take. We are ready to serve, not be served when we come to worship God. So many times, many people come to worship God with a selfish attitude. What am I getting out of it? Rather than what can I give to it? You see? And when we worship God selfishly, can we really say our worship is pleasing to the Lord, who selflessly gave Himself on the cross for our sins? We should want to convert as many people as possible in as short a time as possible. And we don't have that long, you know that? You live to be 70, 80 years, you're, you're, you're doing pretty good. You know? How many more years do you have? Well, if the course of life is what men say it is, I've probably got about 5,000 more days. How many do you have? You know? That's not much time, is it, when you put it in that way? How many years is that? 15, maybe. And that's by reason of a lot of strength. So we have work to do. And we're not done until they put us in the box. Not done till then, till our breath goes out of us. We need to have a strong commitment to what's right. We need to be on board and on fire to serve the Lord and do all we can. You know, look at Paul, how many, time, how many different situations he was in and how he couldn't wait to get to the next one. He was on fire. And I don't believe he was some superhuman Christian. He was a man that is what we all ought to be. And that's on fire to serve the Lord. What more can I do? Not how little can I do. Not how much do I have to do. Not how little can I be with God's people. But how much can I be? A whole lot of difference in that, isn't there? In the way that we look at our service to the Lord. And it's not a life of minimum service. Because if you're looking at serving the Lord as minimums, you just want to get by you're not really going to enjoy heaven because it's a place of excessive blessings. And the Lord will bless us with the opportunity to worship Him forever. Now, if you don't enjoy it here, you're not going to have to worry about being up there in heaven because the Lord certainly loves you enough to where He wouldn't put you under that big a bondage that you'd have to do something you don't like doing here. Well, that tells us something, doesn't it? We better get on fire. And we better learn to appreciate worshiping the Lord and doing what He has told us to do and loving His Word and praising Him and adoring Him or we're not going to be able to be in heaven. So let's get busy about that. Well, the church at, at Ephesus, uh, and I'll, I'll put this chart up for just a moment, but I'm not going to, not going to leave it up. This is the goddess Diana. She is a profane woman. She's a goddess that was the goddess of the Ephesians. They worshiped this statue. They had small ones that were made out of silver and other areas. And a lot of the people made their living making statues of Diana. Icons, as we would call it. And they still do it over there in that area right now. They make a lot of money from doing this. Well, Diana was made by man. And again, Ephesus was an illustrious city in its day, and it was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, in the district that is called Iconia today. And it was an important commercial city. Well, it's a place that had a lot of trade routes, a lot of people coming in and out. You can come back to me now. Let's take this chart down. All right. The magical arts were prevalent in Ephesus. And they were associated with the worship to, of, to, of Diana, who was a fertility goddess. 
and she was a goddess of all the crops and a goddess of all the excesses that a person can be, and the passions that a man or woman could get involved in. And involved in worshiping Diana was the act of fornication. And so that was how decadent that these things took place. And in Ephesus, it was a place that rivaled Athens for the number of gods that were served there. Now, again, involved in their worship was the practicing of magical arts and a number of incantations and things along those lines, witchcraft and things like that. And this is evidenced by, num by the number and value of the books they burned. In Acts 19 and verse 19, it says there that there were people in Ephesus that brought all their books out when they heard the Word of God and they obeyed it. In Acts 19 and verse 19, and turn there if you will, and we'll just read that. Acts 19 and verse 19, many of them that used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. For they counted the price of each one of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. And so mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Verse 18, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. So magical arts were prevalent. And what, how far were these people willing to go to turn away from their past life? Well, they took everything that they had made a living from that was decadent and horrible, and they burned it. They turned their backs. I don't know that you could be much more thorough in purging your life of the old life of sin than these people were. They were ready to get rid of their past. They didn't want to live in it anymore. They didn't even want to be tempted to go open one of those books again and look in it. And so they just burned them. Friends, there might be a lot of people, maybe you're one of them tonight that's listening. And maybe the first step you need to make as a Christian, if you're a Christian, and maybe if you're struggling with sin in your life, maybe it's the type of sin that would be remedied by you burning your computer. Maybe you just need to do that. Throwing it out the window, saying, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. It's too much temptation. I'm not going to have it here and have it tempt me and call to me and get me in places I don't need to be going. You know, that may be what you need to do. Now, is that required? No. You should discipline yourself. But guess what? If your right eye offends you, what? Jesus said, pluck it out. Get rid of it. Get rid of the temptation. And that's what they were doing. They didn't want any remnant of their past popping up again. Friends, that also tells us something, that when something has a hold of us, like an addiction of some kind, the best way out of it is to get rid of it. Every remnant of it. I know people that say, well, I just want to wean off of it. I want to go off of it a little bit at the time. Nope. The biblical way is to get away from sin of any kind, any addiction, that has anything that has control over you more than Jesus Christ, you get rid of it. And that may be, you may need to clear your cupboard, you know, if it's taking care of your health, bothering your health. may need to do that. Because you want to present the, your body to the Lord as a fit vessel to go and do His work. And so that may be it. Anyway, the temple that was erected in the, to the goddess Diana, her name also was Artemis, had, again, an entire industry grew up, and it was a thriving industry. Right across the street from the theater was a place where the silversmiths had all of their shops. The silversmiths were making icons to Diana or Artemis, and they were selling these items in portable shrines. Look at verse 23. The same time there arose no small stir about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith that made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the, uh, unto the craft. When he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. You see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost all over Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set for nothing, but also the temple of, God, of the goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed over all Asia and the world, 
and all of her worship would be done. Well, in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was begun about the year 333 during the time when Alexander the Great would have been going around. And this is a picture of the temple of Diana. And I want you to look at the magnificence of it. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was made of marble. This is to a, a, an invented god of men. It was 130 by 60 yards in dimension. Had 127 massive ionic columns that were 60 feet tall. Now you just look at that, put yourself back in that time period, and ask yourself, how in the world did they build something like that? Took a lot of time, didn't it? Took an awful lot of time. It was four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. Now, if you've ever been there, that's a, that's a, that, that is a huge building right there. Well, it was under construction in 333, so it had been around for many, many years. And Paul was in the city where this was the biggest building and the biggest tourist attraction in the world. Notice that the icons to Diana that were made here, Demetrius says to the silversmiths, we're involved, we're about to lose our shirts. Because if what Paul is saying that there are no gods is true, and people believe that, and some of them have already burned their books in this town too. So if he can have an effect here in this town, right underneath the, one of the seven wonders of the world, my goodness, we're going to be in trouble, and we'll lose everything we have. We'll have to go out of business and have a sale for all these icons. And nobody's going to buy if they believe there are no gods. You see the impact of the gospel? You see the impact of truth on an honest heart? And do you see how resented it is by those that don't want to believe it? It's a, he's only preaching the truth. Diana isn't a god. They made her up. They are building their own idols and selling them to people. And the people are walking around, and guess what? Those idols would break. And what would they do? They'd go buy another one. They had portable shrines to Diana. Well, everyone had their own personal God, but if there be no gods, this Paul is a threat. And he and everyone like him is. And in this city, he's already turned the hearts of many people to this belief. Demetrius is mad about it. Again, this is a tremendous structure that's here, and the world is being rocked by the simple preaching of the gospel. Question, folks. Do you suppose we could rock the world tonight if we preach the gospel? I suppose the whole world could be changed if we preach the gospel like we're supposed to be doing? I do. I believe, we, I believe it can. Do you believe the gospel can change people in this area? Yes. But it has to be preached thoroughly. We see that there are people that are interested. You may be one of them that went to the rally the other night in the, at Franz Stadium in Hickory. It speaks well that people are willing to put down what they're doing, and it tells us something. People are interested in hearing something about God's Word. Thousands of people are interested in that in this area. But they need to hear the whole Word, don't they? And they may not like, people may say, well, you know, that's not something that we need. No, give me the truth. I want to hear the truth. Isn't that what you want to hear? You know, people sometimes ask for truth. And many people pride themselves in saying, tell me like it is. Do you really want it told like it is? Paul was telling it like it was at Ephesus. And notice what happened. They almost killed him. And he wanted to go over there and confront them. But the brethren said, no, no, Paul, they'll kill you. They'll drop you where you stand. And so he had other things to do. And they got him out of the city. Well, friends, when you tell someone the whole truth and they say, tell me like it is, and then you tell them like it is, you may be in danger of what happened in Acts 6, where they stoned Stephen. And all he was doing was preaching the gospel to them. He was loving those people. 
And he, taught, he called them some pretty tough stuff, but he was trying to love them enough to get them to be shaken as to who they were. They were pricked in their hearts like they were on Pentecost. But they stoned Stephen to death for preaching the gospel. What a horrible thing. Someone would say today, that's, if that was on the news, that this, this man got stoned to death for preaching from the Bible, wouldn't you think that's horrible? I do. I would think that. But do you know what? We're living in a society where that's less and less of a problem. Because there would be some people that say, well, he deserved it because he was being a bigot and narrow-minded. You know, that's kind of the attitude people have about religious people, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, that's their problem. I want to ask you something. If you're a member of the church, I want to ask you something. And I want you to reflect seriously on this. If you've been following the Supreme Court case that's in, in the court system, the Supreme Court right now, there's a case there about the issue of homosexuality and whether it's a civil right or not. Now friends, if the courts decide that homosexuality is a civil right, do you know what that does to all of us who are spiritual? That means that churches can no longer take a stand against homosexuality or abortion. And that if they do so and persist in doing so, they could be closed ultimately and shut their doors or they could be belittled so much that their influence would be done in the community or they may have to go to jail, lose tax exempt status for teaching what the Bible says is sinful. Now, go into your business meetings. Go into your meeting in your denomination with your board and ask yourself how many people in the church where you go would stand up and say, you know what, we need to preach this even if they do shut our doors. And how many would say, well, we need to tone it down a little bit. You know, everybody knows that these things are wrong. We've got Bibles. We can read them. We don't have to preach on it all the time, so we're just not going to do this. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to preach this section of the Bible because it's offensive, and we could lose a lot of things for doing that. Which would prevail in the church where you go? I don't know how you are, but that's a deep, deep searching question for me. You look at the different society we have, and there is a generational gap that we have. The older people would probably say, we're fine, we're going to teach what we teach because it's the Word of God. But we have a generation coming up that has been weaned on by the world on the serving of self and that everybody's okay and that there's nothing wrong with anybody and if something's wrong it's my problem not theirs. And I'll tell you something, that, that bleeds over into the Lord's people sometimes. We have to be very, very careful that we don't let the world enter into the Lord's body and that we don't become people that will not champion the truth that we will be people that will fold at the first sign of distress. Well, Paul was in distress at Ephesus. I think we can read that from Acts 19. And so were the brethren. They brought two of the brethren out there into this arena right here. And I'll show you this picture because uh, we took this on our trip over there. And we found, found a time when there wasn't anybody on the streets. We went early in the morning and got this picture. Now, if you'll notice, there's up above where there's the examples of conversion, the blue area of this place, that is the ocean. And if you can imagine, this was a, it's been silted in now in that green area that goes to the ocean area. But I want you to notice that this was a seaport. That road that comes in, they had three roads that came into Ephesus. 
At the entrance to each one of them was a bath for people that were coming in after a long time at sea to bathe and keep get themselves clean. This town had city plumbing and city sewage. It was very advanced. If you look down in the arena on the floor, away from the seats, those buildings across the street were some of the shops. Maybe some of them would have been Demetrius's uh, shops, we don't know. But these were the places where the shops were. And this is the arena where the Ephesians shouted for three hours, Great is the goddess Diana. This arena seats over 25,000 people, and it was packed. Well, they brought the Christians and stood them down there on that little floor there. And they shouted, and when someone would try to say something, they would shout them down. Well, Paul's first visit is in Acts 18 and verse 19. Aquila and Priscilla correct Apollos in Ephesus, Acts 18, 24 through 28. He's a notable speaker, but Apollos was a, was a man who was teaching John's baptism. He was teaching the, 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 what he knew of the law, but it was wrong. And Priscilla and Aquila, just members of the church, took Apollos, who is described as an eloquent man. He's popular. He speaks very well. And these two Christians ask him if they could talk to him and explain the way to him more perfectly. And he listened to them, and he changed. That's a humble man, isn't it? He could have been carried away with people liking his speaking ability, but you know what he did? He said, that's a thank you. Aquila and Priscilla were responsible for turning this man from a false teacher into a teacher of the gospel, like he should have been, and changing him into what he ought to be. Well, you know, it takes a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of humility to turn from what you've always believed. And friends, believe me, when we have this program and we're talking to you in your front room, we well know that many of you probably don't believe some of the things that we teach here. But we're going to te keep on teaching the truth. And maybe one day, the humility and the Word of God will touch you and will turn you away from some things that you have always believed. It's not hard, it's not easy to turn your back on something you've always believed. Your pride gets in the way, for one thing. And you want to say to yourself, I couldn't have believed wrong all these years. But then when you look at what the Word of God says clearly and take your glasses of denominationalism off, you see that the Word of God is speaking true and that your practices don't line up with it. And if that's the case with you, we urge you to be like Apollos, to be humble, and to turn from what you have always believed, and turn to the Word of God. Don't turn to me or to turn to one particular church somewhere because there's a lot of people there or because they got a great group of people. No, you turn to Christ and His church his church is His body, and the local church, wherever it is, is His body. And it may be, it's that way whether it's two or three members or whether it's five or six hundred or a thousand. You need to function in the Lord's church as He has fashioned it. Paul comes back in Acts chapter 20 and verse 31 and stays for three years at Ephesus. And Timothy also goes there and preaches. So they've got some good preach. They've had Apollos and Paul and Timothy coming there to preach. And the book of, Eph of Ephesians is written by Paul from prison. He writes them later on. He's in prison in, say, in 61 to 62, and he sends a letter out to them and wants them to, to do what they should and, and admonishes them. Now, the Lord addresses the church in Revelation 2, and it is a sad thing that is, that is talked about. This wonderful group of people that had started with many of them leaving the world, leaving their past lives. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus here talks to them and says, you have left your first love. 
and I'm afraid of you, he says. You've left your first love. You're doing good in a lot of things, but you don't love me. Well, Paul finds some disciples in Ephesus that he meets with them and asks about the Holy Ghost and the questions of baptism, and they explain that they hadn't heard anything about baptism in Christ, that all they'd heard was baptism under John's baptism, that that's all they've ever known. Well, what is the difference in John's baptism and the baptism of the New Testament? What is the difference? Paul instructs these people that way. These are people that have been baptized, but they weren't baptized the right way. He baptizes them in the chapter or, or, or verses 4 through 7 of Acts 19, he baptizes them for the remission of their sins into Christ. Okay? But all they've ever known is the Old Testament baptism. Well, Paul in the synagogue and in the school of Tyrannus teaches for three months, and he disputes and he persuades there. That means he challenges their beliefs. He challenges them on what they're saying and what they're teaching. He's not afraid to do that, and he does it for an extended period of time, about three months. And the school of Tyrannus was a noted place where many people would come, and they would, they would come from a distance to the school of Tyrannus. And he disputes and he persuades. Now notice that word dispute, that means disagrees. And he persuades. He's doing what he told Timothy later on to do in 2 Timothy 4, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he's preaching the Word, okay? Preaching the Word and reproving and rebuking. The Word of God has that capacity, friends. You can reprove and rebuke, all right, with the same word, and you can exhort with the same word, all right? So, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting, and that's in 2 Timothy. I'm going to go over and, and go ahead and read that. He says there, I charge you therefore, Timothy, before the Lord and uh, Lord Jesus Christ, that will judge the quick and the dead. Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own men, own lusts they shall keep to themselves teachers, having itching ears, that will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will be turned aside unto fables. Friends, it just, it's a sad thing, but Paul was warning Timothy that if he didn't preach the truth and reprove, rebuke, and exhort, and that is gospel preaching, that there was going to come a time when people didn't want to hear that, and they would be putting pressure on people to preach something else. And he says, you've got to watch out for that, Timothy. You preach the Word, and you do it with no apologies, no backing up. And notice what Paul's doing here. He's disputing and he's persuading. Does he persuade everybody? No. Jesus didn't do that. None of the apostles ever converted everybody they ever talked to. There were a number of people. They made enemies. The gospel will cause people to be really mad about you. And it's interesting that history records that all the apostles ended up dying because of what they did, except for John who probably died a natural death, but we don't know that. They tried to kill him, put him on Patmos and isolating him, but he survived. And he writes the book of Revelation from the book of Isle of Patmos. Well, Paul's message that he preached, what did he preach? He was preaching the kingdom of God. Verse 9, and many Jews hardened their hearts and spoke evil of the way. Now notice that term, the way. Now, where does that come from? Remember what Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You don't come to God through Diana. 
You don't come to God through Zeus. You don't come to God through Jupiter or Hermes or by coming to God through Arte or any other God, Poseidon or anyone like that. He's saying that the way to God is through Him. And He was preaching the way. It is Jesus that says, there is one way that leads to life. It's a narrow path, a narrow way that leads to life eternal. And few there be that find it. Well, many of the Jews had hardened their hearts and spoke evil of the way. That's what he's talking about there. Paul moved on to the school of Tyrannus and taught there for two years. In verses 9 and 10, he taught for many times and then to synagogues for three months. And then the school of Tyrannus, again, disputing in the synagogues and teaching. Evidently, those at the school of Tyrannus respected Paul. What type of credentials did Paul have? Remember, he's not doing this as a member of the church, as a, as a, as a church action. He's doing this individually. He's teaching the gospel individually. And he's doing through, using the means of a school to do so. Well, he speaks at the school of Tyrannus, and does he just talk about philosophies and the gods of the world? No, he's not teaching secular things. He's teaching the gospel. He's preaching and teaching the gospel and using the means there to do that. He taught there for two years and kept going and kept going and kept going. And evidently, he did a lot of teaching and a lot of good. What's he doing? He's sowing the seed. What did Jesus say to his apostles in Mark? He said, look upon the fields for they're white into harvest. The fields are white. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Well, you get the idea that Paul was a lazy man, do you? No. Seemed like he just looked for new ways, every time, every way he could. That was a scriptural way to get the gospel to people and to preach the gospel to people. And here he is doing it at a, at a secular school, doing that, teaching the truth. They let him, and that's amazing that they let him do that. But remember, Paul was one of the most educated Jews of the time. Paul was a tremendously talented man. He was a mover and shaker among the Jews, and if he had stayed a Jew, he would have been one of the top, top ones. He was schooled at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Jew of Jews, he says, and that's his own description of him. That's, where he, that's what he was on his way to being. Well, there were miracles that took place at, at Ephesus, and remember a miracle is that which is something that is beyond the realm of anything reasonable that you and I would do, beyond the realm of something that can be explained naturally. And notice what happened, has to take place here. Look at verse 11 and 12 of chapter 19. Now, I know that on this station there have been some people that have tried to sell what they call prayer cloths. And their basis for doing that is from Acts 19, if they have a basis. And it would have to come from here where there were special miracles that were taking place uh, where claws were involved in that. These were special miracles, verse 11 and 12. Now, they were for a time. Notice that miracles and tongues and all of that, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, would cease. So we see that, or 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, that these things would cease. But notice these miracles are confirming and validating that what Paul and the others are teaching is the truth. That's what a miracle did. It wasn't done for a show. It wasn't done for merchandise. It doesn't say that Paul and the, and the, uh, was selling claws to people. No. But some people on this station have sold prayer claws to people and told them that if they send them their money, they'll send them a prayer cloth and that they'll be richer if they just believe in that prayer cloth. Well, how much clo how, is that pretty much close to idolatry? That you have some icon or some special thing that man assigns a worth to, and you think it has magical powers? I think that's pretty close, isn't it? Well, certain Jews invoke the name of Jesus in an attempt to cast out demons. Again, in verses 13 and 14, and again, if you look at Acts 19 and what happened here in Acts 19, 
Some people are saying these are false people. They're not really serving the Lord like they should. But in Acts 19, looking at verse 13 and 14, again, if you have your Bibles, check this out because we don't just want to put a scripture up there and you just sit and read it and say, well, that has to be what it says because he put it up there. No. Acts 19 and verses 13 and 14. Certain of the vagabond Jews, now again, these were riffraff. They put themselves out to be exorcists. Now, what is an exorcist? That's someone who casts out a demon. Well, in the New Testament times, there was demon possession. But it quickly faded as the gospel proceeded and as it got going, and their need for that stopped happening. Exorcisms were something that were ancient, first century things, and they died within the first century. Why? Because they were God's plan to show the power that He had while the Word was in process, the power that truth has over evil, and the power of those that have this gift of exorcism, that they have the ability to cast them out. But there were false people like that. They were pretenders. And it says, they took upon them to call over them that had evil spirits the name of Jesus. They didn't believe it. They were just calling the name over. And they said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. So they were using the name of, of, of Jesus to call out a demon. Well, it says, there were seven sons of one man named Siva who was a Jew, and he was chief of the priests and they, which did this. And the evil spirit answered and said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Well, what reaction did they have? The, way, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, and prevailed against them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. All right? Now, you don't think there's, the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor? These people are charlatans. They're, they're fakes. And the man that has the demon legitimately that they're trying to cast out, the demon causes the man to jump all over them and whoop him and whip them and strip them naked. And they run away. Why? Because they didn't have the power to start with. Again, they were fakes. Fake healers, you see. And there's a lot of those today, isn't there? Well, the man in whom the evil spirit leaped out, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks and everyone that dwelled at Ephesus. And fear fell on everyone. And the name of the Lord was magnified. You see the power of the miracle? Caused people to sit up and listen. You know what? This is known all over town. It's a town of 200,000 people, and it made the news everywhere on every street corner. What, you hear what happened over there? You see? Those men must be telling the truth. What happens? The word of the Lord is advanced. Again, remember, this was not some show they put on in the arena one day. This was an event that happened privately. But what happened was the result, the word of mouth, it spread. We got to listen to these people. Don't you, don't you just walk away from them because they've got something to say. Now, Jesus and Paul were known by the demons, but they didn't know these other guys. The Jews were overcome and fled naked and wounded. Well, the results of Paul's work. What happened at Ephesus in Acts 19, 17 through 20? Two reactions. Some feared, and the name of Jesus was magnified. So fear of God and magnification of the Word. The Word became clearer. The miracle worked. Many that believed confessed and told their deeds confessed what they had done. Those that practiced magical arts burned their books. And the value of 50,000 pieces of silver, by the way, friends, is about two and a half million dollars in our, in our society today. So these people took the equivalent at that time of two, and in our time, of two and a half million dollars and burned it. Is that dedication? Is that turning your back on your wicked ways? Yeah sure is. They didn't want to live that way anymore. The gospel changed these people. In verse 20, a beautiful passage. 
so mightily grew the Word of God, and it prevailed. And friends, that, this was a time where the Word of God prevailed. People listened to it. And a town of, that was a, a heathen town was changing. Now, again, the Word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Paul stays here for three years. And the church at Ephesus grows. And these members of the church are great people. And they have turned their back totally on the world. Well, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians in just a moment and look at what happened with them. So Paul planned to leave Asia and pass again through Macedonia and Achaia on his way to Jerusalem, desiring also to see Rome one day. And he sends Timothy and Erastus ahead, but the, he stays in Asia for a while. And there's a riot in verses 23 and 40 through 41 in Ephesus, instigated by this man named Demetrius, who rallied the people against the disciples because of the gospel threatening their business. Two of the Paul's companions were caught in verses 29 through 32. They dragged Gaius, Gaius and Aristarchus into the arena. And they are ready to do damage to them. And they are hot mad at what's going on. The Jews put forth a man named Alexander to try to reason with the people. And he was shouted down. It wasn't three hours, it was two hours, I'm sorry. And the mob rules and they chant, they chant, they chant, great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. What are they trying to do? They're trying to increase their business, folks. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to yell people and holler at people and intimidate people to where they will believe that Diana is better to be served than God. And so they keep going, they keep going. Well, this Alexander can't be heard, and so they bring out the town clerk at Ephesus. And he calms the situation, and he dismisses the assembly. And he puts a stop to it on a civil basis. You don't have, the civil unrest is not what we need. Friends, there's a lot of people that will try to intimidate you into being quiet about Jesus. They'll try to intimidate, they'll try to hurt you. But you just keep on speaking the truth. Don't do it with an angry attitude or a mad attitude or a vindictive spirit. Do it because you love people, because you love their souls, and you sincerely want them to go to heaven. Reason with them. But you know when certain people, when a group of people get so bad that you can't reason with them, you're not really doing yourself or the Lord any favors by continuing to try to preach and teach to people that don't want to hear it. And so the only thing you can do is realize that sometimes you're just casting your pearl before swine and you have to walk away. Come back again like Paul did at Lystra and Derby. Now in Acts chapter 19, remember we talked about some people that were there in verses 1 through 7 who Paul found that had been baptized with John's baptism. Paul knew something was wrong with their conversion since they didn't know anything at all about the Holy Spirit that Jesus said that He would send to the apostles. And they had no idea. Jesus said, I'll not leave you comfortless. Well, Paul's second question and their response is in verse 3. And he said to them, Under what were you baptized then? And they said, Well, we were baptized in John's baptism. What is John's baptism? Ephesians, it is to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, that Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay? So they knew at Ephesus that there was one baptism. I knew how, I wonder how they knew that. Because Paul had preached it, hadn't he? He had preached that. Well, you know, it's in the Ephesian letter, if you'll turn to uh, your Bibles and go over to Ephesians 2 and verse 8. 
Now, if you're a Calvinist, this is a very popular passage with you. And it says this, For by grace are you saved. Who's he talking to? The Ephesians. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Well, the Calvinist walks away and says, See there? You're saved by faith only. Well, let's read on. The Ephesians weren't saved at the point of faith, friends, because let's read on what it says. In Acts 19 and verse 5, at the establishment of the church, this is the beauty of having the history book to go back and see what really happened, you know. Well, let's go back to Acts 19 and see what these people did in verse 5. Upon learning that the disciples at Ephesus had been baptized with John's baptism, Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after them, that is, in Jesus Christ. But verse 6 says, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Christ. Well, now wait a minute. Ephesians 2 8, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So these are saved people, but how'd they get saved? Just by grace? Oh no, just by grace and faith? No. How about just faith? Nope. How about just grace? Nope. Because both of those were not competing concepts. Grace, faith, obedience, and baptism were all a part of how these people were saved. When you take the history of the church and what they did, and how baptism was a big, a big point there at Ephesus, and how the, uh, Paul says that there is one baptism in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. You see how that baptism is incorporated in faith and is a work of faith? It's one of the things we must do in order to be saved, friends. Paul knew about it in Acts 22 and verse 16, a few chapters after 19. He, he relates how he was saved. He gives the history of Acts 9. And it says there that he was told that he needed to be baptized. And verse, chapter 22, verse 16 gives some, some further information where he says that he was told, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul was baptized to wash away his sins, friends. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Why were you baptized? Now let's look at some of the parallels that are drawn with John's baptism. Paul's second question, what were you baptized into? They said, we're baptized into John's baptism. His question wasn't uh, what, his, what his question was and was not. Let's look at it. Paul's question implies it's important that one knows that one understands and that one believes when they're baptized. Because he asks them, he says, well, tell me about, tell me about what you, how you were baptized. They had to know something, didn't they? And they did. They said, well, we were baptized into John. They're just as honest as they can be. We were baptized into John's baptism. Well, what was John's baptism? Well, he, the person had to know, they had to understand, and they had to believe, because when they realized they hadn't been baptized right, what did they do? They were baptized right. Now this tells us something, that just getting wet doesn't do it, folks. John baptized in the Jordan. Jesus' disciples baptized in the Jordan and other places. Well, they had been baptized, but their baptism wasn't effective. Is it possible today that you were baptized, you got wet, but that it wasn't effective? It was not a baptism that was something that God would approve? If so, you need to do what these people did and do it right. They weren't so proud, they say, nope, I got wet once and that's all I'm getting wet. And then made what they know now retroactive to what they knew then. They'd had Christ preach to them. But they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit at all, had no idea what that was. And they didn't know much about Christ. Well, John's baptism was an Old Testament, um, had, a, had an Old Testament application. It was only for the Jews. And it was temporarily authorized by God, Matthew 21 
and Luke chapter 7. It was something that was talked about in, in uh, the last chapter of Malachi. Well, we see there that the Malachi ends, the last book of the Old Testament, ends talking about John the Baptist, <clears throat> who would come in the spirit of Elijah, who would turn the people's hearts unto the Lord. He would be a forerunner. He would be the one that would pave the way for what Christ was going to be teaching. Now remember, Jesus Christ Himself lived and died under the old law. So did John the Baptist. But part of John's teaching, authorized by God, because He was God's agent, so what He taught was from God. But what He did, He had a baptism of repentance unto the remission of sins, or for remission of sins. But it was a baptism of repentance. Now these are some things that just can't be true under John's baptism. Now if a person lived and died under the time of John's baptism, they would be saved if they were baptized under John's baptism. Just like someone who lived and died under the other part of the old law, they would be saved when Christ died on the cross. It was in view of, you see. It was in view of salvation, not because salvation had been accomplished. Well, they couldn't have been baptized properly because baptism, Romans 6, is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and Christ hadn't died and buried and was arose. So John's baptism wouldn't be valid if Jesus had already died and was buried and arose. And it wouldn't recognize that the Holy Spirit had been sent to teach the new gospel of Christ, the new law. So these people were involved in the, the new law was in effect, and they had been baptized under old law principles. John's baptism was unto the remission of sins. In other words, in view of. It's coming, but it's not here yet. Okay? New Testament baptism was because Christ had died, He, had, he was buried, and He arose. You're not looking forward to Him coming, you know He came. You know He accomplished what He came to do. Jesus, uh, John's baptism was pointing to Christ and His kingdom, but the kingdom hadn't come yet. And Christ had not revealed Himself fully at the, at the point, and really hadn't begun His ministry when John was preaching at that time. Well, they would not been baptized into Christ. So if you haven't been baptized into Christ, you're not in right relationship with the Lord, are you? Again, these are people that lived on the other side of the cross, and they had been baptized like they lived on the other side, on the Old Testament. All right. Now how do we put Christ on in baptism when He hadn't even died yet? How does His blood cover our sins when a man hasn't even died on the cross for us? It can't, can it? So their baptism was not a valid baptism, although they got wet and it was the same action, and it was a commanded baptism for its time. But it wasn't the right one. Now even though they had been baptized, they were still needing their sins washed away, and they still needed to be added to the church. Now since the baptism of John was insufficient to save them, then we want to ask a question. How can denominational baptism save anybody? How can that happen? Denominational baptism is not for remission of sins. It's not unto salvation. It's not into Christ, and it's often not immersion. False doctrines regarding the church and the kingdom and the salvation and the Godhead and any number of other doctrines that are taught falsely to people, how in the world can you be baptized right and taught wrong. Every seed produces after its kind, doesn't it? And you can't plant, plant bad seed and expect a good crop to come from it. So the seed is the Word of God. What does it produce? A saved Christian when it is planted in that good and honest heart, that good soil. So what happened with these people? They were baptized again. Now. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, by His authority, not John's authority. The baptism taught by Jesus and commanded by His apostles was that which 
these people obeyed. Why? Because they were living in the time of the New Testament. There's only one effective baptism today, friends, and that's the baptism of Christ for the remission of our sins. It is by the authority of the Holy Spirit, and the result when one is baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is that gift of the Holy Spirit? Salvation. Salvation could not have been promised under John's baptism that it had already taken place because it was still to come, you see. It's baptism of repentance unto salvation, but not because salvation has been accomplished by the death of Jesus, you see. Well, let's look at two charts. Let's illustrate this if we can. Look at John's baptism. Luke chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 deal very clearly with this. John's baptism was only for Jews. John's baptism was in the name of God. It was part of the old law. It was with the authority of God in the old law. And it was in hope of the Messiah that He would come and accomplish all that God sent Him to do. But it hadn't happened yet. So it was a baptism of repentance unto remission of sins, looking forward to remission of sins. Christ's baptism, however, is for every creature. Matthew, or Mark 16, 15, and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You see, that's not just for the Jew. That's for everybody. And that's Christ's baptism. Also, it was the name of the to- in the name of the total Godhead. By the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the plan had been completed, you see. All of deity had completed the plan made before time began that Jesus would come and die on the cross, be buried, and would arise. And so New Testament baptism is also a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. John's baptism couldn't be that way because it was not, Jesus had not died, had not been buried, and had not arisen when John's baptism was in force. It was a requirement of the new law to be baptized for remission of your sins today, and a person can't be pleasing to Christ without being baptized for the remission of their sins today. Now, I know some of you may not agree with that, but you've got to go argue with Acts 2.38. You've got to argue with 1 Peter 3.21. You've got to argue with Galatians 3.26 and 27, where it says, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus for, remember the sentence is continuing, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now when do you put on Christ? In baptism. You don't put Him on in faith, just in faith. You put Him on after you've been baptized. Now Christ's baptism is also in confidence that Jesus is our Savior today. Not that He's going to be coming and not that He's going to accomplish what He came to do, but because He did. You see, And my faith is built on a Savior. When Jesus is preached, when the way is followed, we see that we are going to end up doing what the way says, what Jesus says, what the truth says, what the light says. And that is to be obedient to Him and come having taking advantage of that blood that was shed for us through His grace. And I believe that, and I am moved to do what He has told me to do. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. You'll keep my commandments. So, whatever the Lord tells me to do, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it like He says to do it, for the reason He says to do it. And anything short of that is not according to His will, therefore invalid. Okay. So friends, tonight, we don't have John's baptism today, but we do have denominational baptism. All right, John's baptism and Christ's baptism, notice John's baptism was a pledge that when he comes, I'll serve him. Repentance before baptism, remission of sins was future. The gift of the Spirit was not accomplished in Acts, until, in Acts, uh, until Acts 19. Christ had not died yet. And then notice that Christ has come. We still have repentance before baptism. We have remission of sins now, but it is not future, it is a reality. The gift of the Holy Spirit was given in Acts 2, verse 38. 
That's the gift of salvation that comes through obedience to Jesus Christ when we are baptized in water for the remission of our sins. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is a reality now. It was in prospect then. It was certainly going to come, and you had to believe it was, but it had not yet been accomplished. So the blood was shed. Well, let's look at today at, and parallel this with denominational baptism. Let's say that you have been immersed in water. Let me ask you something. First of all, were you immersed very quickly after you realized what you needed to do? Or did they save you up till baptizing day? Were you baptized when they had a whole bunch of you saved up to do it at the Easter service or at the Christmas service? Did they save up a crowd and heat the baptistry up and then baptize a bunch of you? Or was it the same hour of the night and urgency to be baptized? So again, that tells you something. Because Acts 16, it took the Philippian jailer the same hour of the night and baptized him and his household. Now, denominational baptism, friends, denominational baptisms, that's Protestant baptisms. I do not know, and I'm sure there are some exceptions here and there in some obscure way, but from what the churches teach, I know of no church that baptizes for remission of sins. Somebody says, well, now wait a minute. The Mormon church baptizes for remission of sins, and so do the Catholics. Okay, but the Catholics sprinkle you. They pour you, or they'll immerse you. But generally speaking, they baptize babies. And the Mormon church. The Mormon church doesn't even believe the Bible is the complete Word of God. They're teaching wrong. The seed is sour. The seed is not what it needs to be. So the product can't be a good product. When you're taught wrong, well, somebody says, well, now I'm not real sure why I was baptized. Well, if you don't know, go back to Acts chapter 19. These people understood why they were baptized. And they said, we were baptized under John's baptism. We don't know anything about the Spirit. We have no idea what we did. Well, friends, just be honest. Did you know what you were doing when you were baptized? If you were an infant, you didn't. If you were a person that didn't, didn't have any idea what, what baptism was all about or what it meant, but you just got wet because your friends did or because your preacher told you you should or because you got real emotional one day and, and went up and whatever they wanted you to do, you'd have done it. But you really don't know why you did it. Well, a person that's been baptized into Christ can tell you why they did it what they understand, and they know exactly why, and the whole reason, and what it's all for, and they understand all of that. In Acts chapter 2, what did those people know? They knew they were sinners. They knew they could do nothing about their sin. And they cried out and said, what does the Lord want me to do? What shall we do? They were told, repent and be baptized. And what did they do? They did it. They repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins. Then what happened? They grew. The Lord added them to the church and they grew. They started out as babies like we all do, and then they grew in relationship to the Lord. So denominational baptism can't be valid and can't be New Testament baptism because New Testament baptism is for remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Also denominational baptism is generally necessary to join the church, but not for forgiveness of sins. Someone says, how do you know that, preacher? Well, all you got to do is read their literature. Hiscock Standard Baptist Manual, page 70, I believe it is. Don't quote me on that, but it's in Hiscock Standard Baptist Manual. It says there that baptism, in the New Testament times, baptism most likely put someone into the church and saved them at the same time. That's what it says. But now it's not so. Baptism is essential to be in the Baptist church, but it is not essential to be saved. So if you were baptized in the Baptist church, friends, you were baptized to join a church, not to go to heaven. Because they, would, they teach, Calvinism teaches, that you're saved at the point of your faith. And that you're baptized as a second work of grace. 
In other words, you're baptized to show your faith in the Lord. But you're saved at the point of faith, they'll tell you. What's wrong with that? Well, it makes Jesus a liar. Because in Mark 16, verse 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that disbelieves shall be condemned. So when is a person baptized or saved? He that believeth, Jesus says, and is baptized shall be saved. Now, let me show you what happens when somebody says, no, you're saved at the point of faith. Okay? Let's read the passage that way now. He that believes and is saved can then be baptized. Is that what the passage says? No. That would make Jesus a liar, wouldn't it? Because what men teach and what Jesus says are totally opposite. They're backwards. Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Faith essential to save you? Yep. Not alone. Baptism essential to save you? Yep. That's how you put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Is God confused? Has He given us competing passages? No. He's given us the whole counsel of God. We can read all of it and put it all together and say, you know what? Baptism is mentioned so much in the Bible as for remission of sins, and it washes our sins away, and that it's something that we're say that saves us. We better believe that, because Jesus said it, the apostles said it, and the Holy Spirit sent the message to all of us that it's essential. And we better believe it, hadn't we? If we want to go to heaven. Well, the Bible teaches that the Lord adds to the church. You're not baptized to join a church. You're baptized for remission of sins to be saved. And when you're saved, what does the Lord do? He adds you to His church. You don't have to be voted on by a council of deacons. You don't have to put your membership forth to see if you can be a Christian there. No, you join yourself to a local congregation. How do we know that? Because Paul did with the Jerusalem church. And initially they didn't want to have him because they were scared of him. He was a persecutor. Well, you see in Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, the Lord added to the church daily, verse 47, those who were being saved. What were they doing? Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. And the Lord added to the church daily who well, was being saved. Well, denominational baptism by its own admission has nothing, so, any, nothing whatsoever to do with you doing anything with your sins. Your sins are forgiven when you say the sinner's prayer and you just accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And do you know that there were 7,000 people the other night that were told that? I tell you what, folks, if I could get a crowd of 7,000 people together in one place, I would not hesitate to say you need to be baptized for remission of your sins. I would teach them they must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and become a recipient of the grace of God that's been extended to all mankind, but they need to receive that gift in the way God said to receive it. I would teach that faith saves you. I would teach that repentance is essential to your salvation. Confession is essential. And the reason I'd preach that is because the Bible says it. I would not stop short. I wouldn't just leave people hanging. The number of people are ready to do the right thing. You don't just leave them there without the right answer. You tell them the whole counsel, friends. And it is so sad when that's not done. Washing away sins in Acts 22, verse 16. When do your, are your sins washed away? Born well, baptism. Is it the water that saves us? No, but it is the blood. And it's received in the waters of baptism. Why did, would Peter, in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, why would Peter say, the like figure, where to even baptism, doth also now save us, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through Christ? Why would he say that? Why in the world would he say that? That's 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, not 2 Peter. Now what's he talking about there? He's talking about the flood. He's talking about water, wherein eight souls were saved by water, the like figure, wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Somebody says, what does water have to do with it? Well, the water saved Noah, didn't it? But it destroyed everybody else who didn't believe in, in what God said about the water. 
Well, one was receptive to that and listened and obeyed, and the waters that destroyed everyone else were the means by which the ark was lifted and sustained Noah for the entire time of the flood. God provided salvation. Salvation was in the ark, not outside. Well, there are people today that say water baptism has nothing in the world to do with your salvation. We've had some of you call in and tell us that, to which we have pointed you to these passages we've talked about. And you've read them. Sometimes you've read them with our operators, and you've said, I don't believe it. I know I was saved at the point of my faith, and that's what I'm going to believe. Well, friends, if that's what you want to believe, then you can believe it. But it's not what the Bible says. Maybe what your church teaches, or what your grandma taught you, or what your daddy did. But they could be wrong, just like you could be wrong. And you don't go back and depend on what your daddy or your mama did or did not do. If your daddy and mama are dead and gone, and they could talk to you right now, they'd say, you, you believe in what that Bible says and what these people are telling you about what God told you to do. Don't do what I've done if they're lost. Uh, pardon me, allergy. Apologize for that. All right. Well, denominational baptism also is an outward sign of an inward grace. And again, that's what they say. It's the way that you show that you're already saved. And notice denominational baptism can be by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. It's administered to infants. <coughs> Pardon me again. It's administered to infants due to, the, to the, the teaching of Calvin that a person inherits the sin of Adam. Now really, if you believe that, you would have to accept the idea that an, if an infant's born in sin, if we, if we inherit Adam's sin, all babies are, are sinners from the day they come into the world. They're not innocents. But none of you believe that, I'm pretty sure. But that's what your churches teach. That's why they baptize babies, folks, because they believe they're lost. Well, denominational baptism does that. My mother was a member of the Episcopal Church, and that's what the Episcopal priest said, that you need to baptize your baby as soon as they're born so they won't die and go to hell. That's what their priest told them. And my grandmother believed that till the day she died. She knew the truth and said she knew the truth, but she said, I was born an Episcopalian, I'm going to die Episcopalian. And she did. That's sad, folks, because she knew that the Episcopal Church wasn't teaching the truth, but she died in it. And if she could come back today and talk to me, she'd say, you just keep on following the Bible. The New Testament baptism says that salvation comes after belief in baptism, Mark 16. We already demonstrated that. It must be by immersion in water. Acts chapter 8, what did the eunuch do when Jesus was preached to him? He, he said, well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. What a wonderful place for Philip to have said to the eunuch when he said, I, be, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. For Philip to have said, well, you're just, you're just fine. That's just great. You're saved because you've accepted Jesus. And you don't even need to get in the water. Remember the man had already asked after Jesus was preached to him, here's water, what keeps me from being baptized? Why would he ask that? What would possess a man from Ethiopia to ask Philip, here's water? When Jesus had been preached to him, why would he come to the conclusion that water needed to be involved at all? If you're saved at the point of faith, friends. You see, that'd be a silly question, wouldn't it? And it'd been something that Philip would have needed to correct and say, well, no, you don't need to worry about it. You're saved. You've already said Jesus is the Son of God. But that's not what he did. He believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He had heard Jesus preach to him. It convicted his heart. And he was ready to be baptized for the remission of his sins. Same as, the, as Lydia and her household, the Philippian jailer, the church at Thessalonica, the people in Thessalonica, 
the people in Berea, the people at, in all the places we have talked about, in Ephesus tonight, ready to do whatever God's plan is, they were all willing to do it. But yet we still have people today, and you may be one of them, that says, I, baptism is not for remission of sins. I was saved at the point of my faith when I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, invited Him into my life, and that's what I'm going to believe and what I'm going to die with. Well, friends, you can do that. But you better be sure that you have Scripture for it and that you don't isolate a passage out here and say, I'm going to do this one and I'm going to leave the rest of them alone. No, that's dishonest. Baptism is for people who can decide for themselves and be convicted in their own hearts, not infants, not people who are not responsible for what they do. Those people are safe, so they don't need salvation. They are saved, safe, in safe relationship with the Lord. Well, all of us that understand and can tell a reason for what we're doing, we're the people that need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. And that's what the Lord wants all of us to do. No, He's not a respecter of persons. doesn't give you one thing to do and me something else. Now, friends, up to this point, we have covered these different conversions in the Bible. I want you to notice what every last one of them has in common. Every last one of them has something in common, and what is it? Well, if you look, it is that every last one, the, the people on Pentecost, the people in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, those the, the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, Saul in Acts 9, Cornelius in Acts 10, Lydia and her house, the jailer, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Thessalonians, and on and on. These are people that were all baptized. Why were they all baptized? Because it was essential. Now someone says, well, did they believe and repent and confess? Mm-hmm, they did, because that's a part of God's plan. God took them for where they were, and told them what they needed to do from that point. If they already believed, He didn't tell them to believe. If they already had confessed, He didn't tell them to confess. If they already repented, He didn't say anything about repentance. But it is implied because other passages teach it. And one person is not saved one way and another person the other. Necessary implication. Well, strong faith and honest convictions when possessed in error, friends, are not enough to be obedient and pleasing to God. Again, honest motives and good intentions would certainly fall true for Cornelius and his household. But it certainly, Cornelius and his household were lost. One can't be taught error pertaining to one's salvation, including baptism, believe that error, and then be obedient to the Lord. Remember at Ephesus tonight, we talked about this. The people, when they found out they had done the, they weren't baptized the right way, they changed. Into what were you baptized? Just ask yourself, were you baptized as an infant? If you were, is that a valid baptism? According to the Bible, no. If you were baptized by sprinkling or pouring, is that the right mode of baptism? The word baptism itself means to dip below, to plunge, to immerse. That's what it means. Baptizo, the Greek word. So sprinkling and pouring was not done until many centuries later. And the first time it was done is because to save an old wicked king because he didn't want to, they were on his deathbed. And he was given what was called an extreme unction. Okay? But baptism was always immersion for the first few hundred years after, after Pentecost. Now, were you baptized because you had already been saved? And if you don't know, then you weren't baptized right, friends. If you don't know why you were baptized, you weren't baptized properly. If you were baptized into a denominational church, is that scriptural baptism? No, because denominations didn't exist in the first century. So baptized into a denominational church, you're not a Christian, like the Bible says. 
And ask yourself this, this question, just as an interesting question, what are you religiously? Because Bible baptism produces a Christian. That's it. It doesn't produce a Baptist Christian or a Methodist Christian or Episcopalian Christian or a Catholic. It doesn't. It's a Christian. If you're, were you baptized to please your parents and your granddaddy and grandma? If you were, that's not the proper motive. Maybe you believe that you were baptized for remission of sins. But what did you know about the Lord's church? Because the kingdom is part of the teaching of Jesus. You can't teach the head without the body. Were the men that Paul met baptized unto the remission of sins? Were they baptized to obey God? They were. Were they sincere when they were baptized? Yes. Were they humble enough to submit to the truth when they heard it? Yeah, they were. The Lord should be respected, friends, and reverenced and obeyed. Repentance is not just a change of mind, but a change of action. Societal change is not the gospel main, main objective. It's a powerful force for the change in society, but the purpose of the Word of God is not to change the society we live in. But people that are Christians that live like they should will change the society where they are. They'll make a noise without making a noise by their example. Well, those who have been baptized correctly have to put away sin from themselves, from their lives. Have you heard and do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Have you confessed it? Have you the faith to obey what He has told you to do and repenting and being baptized for the remission of your sins? And you'll be in the body of Christ. He'll add you to it. Well, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, You He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked according to the world, according to the powers of the air, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ, raised us up together, and made us to sit in heavenly places, that in ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness through Christ Jesus. Friends, we believe that the vision, purpose, and being in Christ it can be accomplished with you. And we're stand ready to help you tonight. Come to the meeting in November the 4th through the 10th, and we look forward to seeing you at the church services, the Newton Church of Christ, or wherever you might be close to, the services of God's people. If you Thank you again for your time tonight. You've been very kind to let us into your home. And we bid you good evening. Have a nice week.